Suzanne must have that. Okay, there we go. Um, it's just almost the top of the hour. We'll wait just a couple more minutes before we get started. Um, make sure everybody has time to join us. Okay, so uh, I guess we'll go ahead and get started. So hi everyone, and it's now the top of the hour. Um, first, I have just a few housekeeping uh, details to cover. Um, so if you want to go ahead and advance the slide for me, please, Suzanne. Okay, so um, we have posted the closed captioning link in the chat box, and we will also be recording today's session session, and you'll be sent a link to this recording once it's processed and uploaded. Um, all mi microphones are muted, and our speaker will be taking questions um, at the end of the presentation. And if you have a question during this presentation, go ahead and type those into the chat box, but please make sure that you're sending them to all participants. Uh, please fill out the survey that will pop up at the uh, in your browser after you exit the webinar. Uh, if for some reason you don't see the survey when you leave, just send me an email and I can send you the direct link to it. Uh, next slide, please. So I'd like to welcome you today to the NNLM Mid-Continental Webinar Series. My name is Margie Shepard and I am the uh, Technology Coordinator for the Mid-Continental Region of the Network of the National Library of Medicine. I am based out of the University of Kansas Medical Center in Kansas City. The Mid-Continental Region offers a webinar on the third Tuesday of each month, and the presentations uh, feature a variety of topics that are relevant to librarianship, health sciences, technology, research, and community outreach. Occasionally, we may also feature, feature accomplishments of network members and provide updates on our projects. Next slide, please. In case we have some audience members who aren't familiar with the NNLM, I want to give you just a really quick overview of who we are and what we do. The NNLM serves as an outreach and engagement arm for the National Library of Medicine. We provide trainings, funding opportunities, and more to a wide variety of member organizations to help support our mission of advancing the progress of medicine and improving the public's health. Institutional membership is free of charge. And for more information about NNLM, please visit nnlm.gov or connect with your regional medical library at nnlm.gov backslash regions. And I have put that in the chat box uh, for those of you wishing to get some more information. Um, next slide, please. So as librarians, it, it is our job to provide our users with the best tools possible to access information. Uh, and it's even more important when researching health and medical topics. So it's a great pleasure for me to introduce my colleague and our speaker today, who's going to talk to us about PubMed at the Public Library. Jacob White is a librarian in the Research and Learning Department of A.R. Dykes Library at KU Medical Center. Um, prior to becoming a life science librarian, Jacob worked in public libraries and nonprofits around the Kansas City area. Outside of the library, Jacob enjoys spending time at the lake and playing board games, and he is an avid gardener. So at this point, we're going to um, pass the ball over to Jacob, and he's going to get started. Thank you, Margie. Yeah. Hi, everyone. Like Margie said, my name is Jacob White, and I am also based in Kansas City at the KU Medical Center. And my primary work is with the School of Medicine, so I help with uh, everything from teaching the first years, how to use PubMed, all the way up through doing systematic reviews with the faculty here at KUMC. And um, there's been, you know, increasing interest in uh, public health issues this year, clearly, and infectious disease issues. And so the public is increasingly seeking information on these topics. And so it's actually a fairly suiting, uh, fitting time for PubMed to have rolled out its latest version, which in my opinion is a lot 
more navigable to the average user. Um, so this uh, session sort of progresses from a very basic introduction to what PubMed is and sort of how you can guide your users uh, at your public libraries to understand the content and coverage of PubMed, as well as what it means for something to be included in PubMed, how to find things, all the way up to maybe more support um, that you yourself would do as a librarian, sort of understanding the um, controlled vocabulary that underpins PubMed, and also looking at a couple examples of maybe questions that someone would bring you and you know, when I was putting this topic together, I was brainstorming a little bit about what public library populations would want to use PubMed and interact with PubMed and also possibly have a librarian at the public library help them. And so some of the populations I was thinking of include uh, high school students working on exercise science or environmental health or environmental science projects, um, engaged citizens who are, you know, uh, looking at different policy ideas or different uh, harms and hazards in the environment, um, policymakers, patient advocates, even, you know, fitness instructors or PE teachers might be interested in some of the literature that's in PubMed, uh, or at least understand what it is and how they could use it if they want to. So, um, the examples that I'm going to give at the end as we get a little more into some of the more uh, complicated uses of PubMed kind of are meant to be tailored to some of these public library patrons who might come in and, um, you know, ask these kind of questions and not know about PubMed as being a resource that they could use to find peer-reviewed primary literature on topics that they're interested in. Uh, so, like I said, the beginning of this presentation is going to be a bit pretty pretty straightforward. What's in PubMed? What is PubMed? And then as we go on, we'll look a little more deeply at some of the more advanced features. Uh, next slide, Margie. Do I control the slide? You control it. Yeah, you can control it, Jacob. Oh, okay, great. Yeah. Can everyone see the slides now? Yes. I can see them. That's a, yeah, there we go. Great. Intro to PubMed. Okay. Thank you. Okay, so this was a little video, but it doesn't look like it's going to play. Um, that's fine, though. We can just pass over it for now. Uh, so here, the agenda, brief introductory refresher, showcase new website features, and then I'm going to click out and share my screen and do some live presenting. And then at the end, we'll have time for question and answer. Okay, so what is PubMed? PubMed is uh, hosted by the National Library of Medicine, which is part of the NIH campus in Washington, D.C. And um, it is collects, stores, makes accessible health sciences information researchers find useful. Um, so most of the journals that are included in PubMed are going to be very specifically on health sciences, life sciences topics, and then also including indexing articles that maybe are not in uh, specifically life sciences journal, but journals that cover the life sciences. Um, one really important thing to bear in mind is that it's not exclusively an app, a repository for NIH research output. Um, sometimes this year I've seen online people sharing things that say, oh, this is an NIH funded study, um, just because it has an NIH.gov end to its URL. But it's really important to realize that um, NLM PubMed is meant to connect people to the primary literature in the life sciences. It's not endorsed by, it doesn't mean that it's endorsed by the NIH. It doesn't mean that it was funded by the NIH. And so, you know, some of the misinformation that I've been seeing online this year that I think could impact public library patrons is people saying, oh, you know, this this study is in an NIH.gov website, and so it must be, you know, funded by the NIH and approved by the NIH. And that's just, you know, that's like saying that a book by Ernest Hemingway was funded by the Leewood City Public Library. It's just, just because it's on the shelf and it might be useful to users of PubMed, it doesn't mean that PubMed NIH has specifically endorsed the content. 
Another important thing to realize about PubMed, and we're still just on the very basic level here, is that it's a, you know, more like a card catalog than a journal. So when you look at search results in PubMed, there is going to be stuff that has full text access connected, even a lot of stuff these days that has free full text connected. But there's also going to be a lot of content that is uh, discoverable in PubMed that if you click out onto the publisher's page, you may hit a paywall. And so that's an important thing for users to know too, is that just because um, PubMed has the link to the citation information and to metadata um, and maybe even some figures, that doesn't necessarily mean that free full text access is available to them. Depending on the situation that their library has at home, they might be able to request items through interlibrary loan. Um, but there is also ways to filter your findings, your results list in PubMed, so that if you only want to find free full text, that's totally fine. Uh, for people who are, are really not familiar with how the science literature works, for a lot of the populations that I was talking about that might be uh, find PubMed useful in the pub that walk through the doors of a public library, such as high school students um, or engaged citizens or um, you know city level policymakers, they may not necessarily need to have full text access. They may get all the information that they need just from looking at the abstract. Um, when PubMed was first getting started. There were limitations, you know, even just when you think about metadata on a catalog card, there's limitations to how many words you could include in your abstract. Uh, these days, those limitations are uh, not as important because we have web pages. And so um, authors are encouraged to give as many details as possible about the contents of their paper in the abstract. And so a lot of the time, you know, just because they can't get the full text access, it doesn't necessarily mean that they can't look at the abstract and find all the information they need, especially at a, a public library patron non-specialist level. PubMed a lot of the time may have all the information that they need. Why should public librarians encourage patrons to use PubMed? Well, for one, researchers have long known that they can trust National Library of Medicine web pages and recognize that they're unbiased. So, on so many web pages that you visit these days, especially relating to health and wellness, you'll find advertisements. A video will pop up and start playing as soon as you click on the website. Or even on some of the um, databases that we really love here, you will possibly be pushed to uh, connect to publisher content, you know, oh, look at our our content first and, and check out our content first before the other ones. So benefits of using PubMed include that it's neutral on publisher content, it's commercial free, you're not going to get hit with videos. And while there are a lot of um, items, you know, in the PubMed universe that have some high resolution pictures and stuff attached to them, by and large, PubMed is going to be relatively accessible for people who are using low bandwidth internet connections on account of it being a heavily text-based website. Um, so like I said, PubMed is maintained by the National Library of Medicine, and it has free web access to Medline, which um, you could sort of think of like originally as being like the card catalog in the National Library of Medicine, and then it went through some iterations of being based on a CD and then based on the web, but Medline is really the core um, database behind that the National Library of Medicine manages and that PubMed provides users access to. So we'll click out here now and we'll look at the benefits of creating an account on PubMed. You don't have to be associated with the university um, or, or even with a school to create a MyNCBI account. Anyone who has an email address or who wishes to create an account on the MyNCBI page can do so free of charge. And in my opinion, there's a lot of really good reasons to do that. Um, so I'm going to just quickly share my screen and show what that looks like.
This is the My NCBI webpage. I already have a login. You have the option to do Google or NIH. You can create an NCBI account. And then you're taken to this page that has several different features on it, including My Bibliography. Let's say you have something in PubMed that you want to include there, your recent activity, different filters that you can apply to different search engines on the NLM website, collections, searches. And one feature that I like and that I think public library users would like too is this highlighting feature. So you can highlight the search terms in your results to make them look easier. Right now I have it on aqua. I'll change it to lime green. Save it. Okay, so that's what setting up a My NCBI account looks like. And as I said, it has this highlight search terms. You can create search alerts. Let's say that there's a topic that you're interested in following. Um, and you can get an email, you know, maybe once a week or once a month. And this is something that patrons can do also um, if they are interested in the topic that they want to follow as new literature emerges. I would encourage them to uh, create a search and then create a search alert. Okay, so one new feature in PubMed, and I'm going to click out here in a second and go into this a little more, is the best match result. So the best match result is based on data that PubMed gathered about how people are using it. And they find that, you know, um, the impact of more mainstream search engines, uh, more commonly used search engines is trickling down into the way that people use PubMed also. And so, um, People are frequently accustomed to finding the information that they want on the first page of the website of a search engine, the first page of the results list. And so PubMed seeks to help people find the best possible information if they're only going to go to the first page, because there could be a really good nugget that's sort of just hidden back a few pages. But looking at the way that um, PubMed users have used the website and just the general trends in searching on the internet for information these days, PubMed wanted to respond by helping with creating an easier best match search. So the benefits of best match, if you're looking for a specific article, it should push it right to the top. It uses the algorithm to weigh search terms. Um, and it's going to assume that people are using it the way that they might use a Google search to just uh, find an answer quickly to their question. Whereas most recent, you'll get the very latest on a topic. So what what just been published? Um, the first page might include some are, um, entries that are not completely relevant. And then most recent can also help you sort of see like what are people talking about now in this field? What's the latest uh, area and how is the conversation playing out now? So just to give an example, I wanted to go out into PubMed and share a search for singular mental health. Um, there were only 11 results, but if I get rid of singular and just search or mental health and just search singular, I get 2,500 results. Right now they're sorted by best match. So I'm seeing what PubMed is encouraging as being the uh, best matches. And then I can also go in here, I can change my sort by to most recent. And now I'll see things only that are the most recent. Over here, I have my filters, my initial filters that I've set up in my MCBI account, include core clinical journals, which is like the main uh, medical articles, only things that are in Medline, so things that have been indexed by the National Library of Medicine and published in the last five years. This down here is a new feature, which tells you a little bit of a snapshot of trends in how this uh, article on this topic are being published, uh, how many come out every year, uh, when they started being discussed and things like that. Further down, this is really useful in the public library setting, what articles are free full text, um, and in these cases, you're going to be able to access the full text of the article. But like I said, for a lot of um, public library users, they may find that just the content that is available through PubMed is sufficient for them. And one 
Another new feature that they can use to get a deeper look at their search results is to change the format to abstract. And here they get to see all the information in the abstract and the article search terms when they appear in the article also show up. So the next element in the presentation is talking about, right, the snippets. That's another example you see. And then we have another really nice new feature, which I'm going to demonstrate here. And so let's say we click this first article. Rather than having to go back to the search results every time, which even on the proprietary databases tends to be the way that they encourage you to do it, instead, you can see a flipping onto your next result, and you get to see a preview of that result before you go to it. So it's more, um, I think it's more natural. It's kind of more like flipping through a card catalog, um, and you get to see a little preview of what you're going to see next before you click into it. The next really nice feature that has just been introduced is this sidebar menu. So we get, you know, the title and authors. That's this information up here. And then we get all sorts of information below it, the abstract. And down here, we have this page navigation. And I'll click back out to demonstrate how that works. Find an article that has more metadata. So here, let's say we wanted to see what grant support this article got. We can just click straight down and it will take us to that part of the page. And so that is also a response to, as I said, you know, when we were just dealing with catalog cards, there was a really strict limitation on how much information could be included in an, an entry. But now that we're working with web pages, the limitations are really more about what's acceptable, what does the publisher find acceptable to be published in front of a paywall, as well as, um, you know, what data is really going to be relevant to help people discover the material that they're looking for. So as entries in Medline have gotten longer and longer, it's really beneficial to have this page navigation so that you can go down and find the article, the element of the search that you're really looking for. Okay. The next really nice new feature is the site feature. Um, and I don't think I need to click out to demonstrate this. It's just, um, you can copy and paste the citations, and you can uh, pick a different format. This could be really beneficial for um, students at the high school level who maybe are being asked to find primary literature and then to properly cite that primary literature. Uh, they might not necessarily need a heavy duty citation manager to handle something like that. And so in that situation, being able to just export a citation in this manner is really useful. So that's another really great new feature from PubMed. Um, other things to sort of talk about here, we're, I'm going to talk a little bit more about term mapping um, as we sort of get more progressive into the more advanced elements of PubMed. Um, but there's new term mapping. We'll talk a little bit more about truncation. And here again, I just want to reemphasize that best match brings the best results to the top. So um, the results list that you're going to get, whether you use best match or most recent, is going to be the same. It's just that in best match, the, the closest results that the algorithm finds in PubMed are going to be brought to the very top of the article of the uh, display. Okay, so here's some advice that um, I have borrowed a decent amount of this from the National Library of Medicine uh, training guides, and this page is really the, the main one that I think just no matter who the patrons are that are using PubMed, these are really beneficial 
uh, things for them to know. So PubMed is really encouraging people uh, to just enter your terms in the search box, be as specific as possible, uh, try not to get too complicated and, and let PubMed take care of it for you. And then if you have a specific known article, um, the algorithms for, you know, matching the author, the journal, the date, the title of the article are uh, improved in PubMed now. So if it's like, oh, you know, I'm citing from this article, but I forgot to download the citation information, or I need to check to see where the researchers are affiliated or something like that, um, PubMed is now even better at just quickly connecting you to that one article that you were looking for. Okay, I'm going to uh, kind of leave the slides now and do some live demonstrations, um, talking about maybe some features that people who are uh, more comfortable already on databases, maybe using some ProQuest and EBSCO databases already that are accessible through their library uh, and familiar with some of these. So if you're, uh, you know, if a student comes to you uh, and they say, you know, I'm really having a hard time finding information about this, and my basic search isn't working, you can help them to uh, broaden their search. Or if they're doing a search and they're saying, I'm getting everything in the whole world, there's 20,000 references, I can't go through all of these, then you could also use some of the more advanced functions in PubMed to help them navigate that. So I'm gonna click away, and at this point, I'm really just gonna be uh, using the PubMed website more to talk about this. So let's click out. Okay, so we're on the home page. I'm logged in. And let's say a student comes to me and they are asking about a plastic bag ban or city ordinances relating to single use plastic bags. And they say, you know, I have looked at this plastic bag ban and I am just not finding anything on this topic. So you say, okay, well, well let's search for it. So we search plastic bag ban. And the articles are looking kind of relevant, but at the same time, they are, there's only six of them. So how could we expand our search from here to find more articles, you know, I mean, one thing we could do is just to uh, erase ban or, uh, you know, think about our keywords a little more. But what I wanted to do is kind of look at some of the indexing that happens in PubMed that really sort of separates it from other more general search databases that people might um, go to right away when they're, you know, sitting at a computer at the live at the public library and sort of put, take a look at some of the um, indexing and how that can help. So this article here, barriers and benefits to desired behaviors for single-use plastic items in Northeast Lake Erie Bay. That looks relevant. And we get information about, you know, the abstract is not super long. Now, right away, we get similar articles which could be helpful. And I'm already seeing a few articles in there that were not on that results list. But I wanna scroll down a little more and look at these indexing terms. So this, the mesh terms and the substances are the controlled vocabulary of PubMed. If you've used some other databases, you may be familiar with the, the sources that they use. Um, or if you use social media, you might be familiar with the idea of tagging things. Now, you know, PubMed tagging is not the same as social media tagging. On social media, the content producer generally gets to apply their own tags. That's not the case with Medline PubMed. Instead, an expert applies the tags so that they are maximally discoverable and accurate as possible. So most articles get, you know, maybe 10 to 20 tags, and then they also can have substance tags if they are also substances in there. 
So here we have the substance plastic, and we can just search and see the 17,125 articles in PubMed that have this indexing term. Okay, and then let's go back and look and see if there were any other tags that are useful. Well, this water pollution legislation and jurisprudence could be useful. Um, let's actually just look and see everything that's in there. So again, in the same way that when we clicked the supplemental concepts uh, with plastic, everything in PubMed that's been tagged with that showed up. And so here we also see anything where the major topic is legislation and jurisprudence related to water pollution pollution is going to show up here. Oh, and right away we get a Kansas one. That's nice. I didn't actually notice that earlier. But a really more, even more advanced look is if we see here, we see that different uh, subheadings can be applied to the same article. And also that, you know, different subheadings can go uh, for various articles. Now that's not the case here, but if you look at the subheading, there's only so many subheadings available. So if we just take this subheading, and what if we say, I want to see everything in PubMed that is on that topic with that subheading. So here we have the different fields in PubMed. Let's say you know already the author of the article that you're searching for. You could put it in here and then search and it would only search in the author field. Let's say that there's a mesh term that you liked, like water pollution, and you wanted to find it and search for it, you could also do that. Now, I want to use the subheading field, and I want to see everything that is on the topic of legislation and jurisprudence as a subheading. So anything that, it doesn't matter if it was water pollution, it doesn't matter if it was, um, you know, air quality, anything where there's going to be the subheading legislation and jurisprudence, it's been returned. And so there were 250,000 articles on legislation and jurisprudence. Okay, so now I have 17,000 articles about plastics and 250,000 articles about legislation and jurisprudence. Now, I probably am going to have some articles where both of those terms overlap. So how do I find those? I'll add my query here, and I'll add my query here, and now I've combined the terms. And when I search, I have 93 results. And these 93 results seem to be more along the lines of, you know, they might not be specifically about plastic bag bans, but here we have things about single-use non-degradable plastic, overview of known plastic packaging. And so, yes, this looks like a complicated search, but all of the uh, data that you need to find to do a search like this, you can get from uh, looking in um, a different, you know, specific entries in PubMed. Okay, so I realize that's kind of complicated, but I did want to share another one that's sort of along the similar line. Let's say a student comes in and they want to look up, you know, they're working on a health and nutrition topic, and they want to look up something about a food swamp. Uh, so if we switch this display, sorry about that, to best match. The first result that we get is about food swamps and food deserts, which is what we're looking for, but if we scroll down a little more, we get wetlands and we get mangroves. And so this is a good opportunity to stop and, and ask what is PubMed doing behind the scenes that we're getting some of these results. If we look in the advanced, we can see details for our search. And what we find is that when we search swamp, we're also getting stuff for wetlands and for um, swamps and swamps. So it's doing the um, truncation for us, but it's also including these terms that we don't necessarily want because our topic is related to obesity and public health and um, how many types of a specific restaurants are in a specific neighborhood. 
So we have 1,440, uh, 1441 results right now. Let's see if we can limit that by applying a mesh term to our search. And we're going to want to try to find the broadest mesh term possible. I'll click here on page navigation. It's nice. I have a lot of rich information in here on this entry. Here I am in mesh terms. Um, so I'm looking. I don't want Baltimore. That's way too specific. Oh, here's humans. So maybe that will help reduce some of the more environmental science and marine biology results that I got. So I'm going to add humans. And I'm going to search. And now I'm down to 181 results. So I shed a lot of unnecessary results there. And when I look at my results, I see that everything seems to be about the food environment which is great. So just by starting with that really broad term and then applying a mesh term, I was able to get, um, or just by starting with the, the term that I wanted to find and then applying a mesh term, I was able to find more information on the topic that I was looking for and more specific information. So what do I do once I have the information that I want? Well, there's a few things. One, I could say I only want a couple of them, so let's just pick out four or five. Now I can hit send to, and I can add them to a collection. I can pick a collection that I already have. Oh, I already have one called food swamp. Or I can create a new collection, new food swamps. Now every time that I log in, you know, I know a big problem back when I was working in the public library world was that people would come in and they would get a bunch of work done and then their computer would log out and then they would lose all their work. So this collection is going to follow you wherever you have an internet connection through the NLM, through my NCBI. You can log in. And not only are you going to be able to see your collections, but you're also going to be able to see your more recent searches and your recent activity. So that's another highly beneficial reason to sign up for my NCBI, regardless of what level of, of research you're actually doing. Okay, I realize that those were kind of complicated examples, but I really wanted to give some examples that were more related to, you know, public policy and uh, citizen empowerment, because, you know, PubMed is meant, you know, it's very valuable for my research population, and uh, people use PubMed thousands of times every day here at KUMC and uh, millions of times every day uh, across the world, over 2.5 million users. Um, but I wanted to give some examples that are going to help connect people who are using public library to the information in PubMed, and then also to give some examples that are going to help librarians find the information that they need on PubMed. And um, the ones that I chose related to the food swamps and related to plastic bag bans, that's not necessarily like the main bulk of the content that you're going to find in PubMed, but that content does exist. And the benefits of using peer-reviewed literature and primary literature that is coming from journals, from scientific journals, it can be a really uh, useful thing, whether someone is an active citizen that's looking into um, what gets sprayed around their neighborhood, or whether they're a student looking up uh, environmental issues, PubMed can work for them and they can be connected to the information that they're looking for through their public library for free, regardless of where they are in the world. And then they can save that information and they can have their own little collections that they keep track of. They can create search alerts to stay on top of topics that are interesting to them. And, um, I would just really recommend, I know that I kind of went through uh, some of those more advanced mesh term related features really fast and also um, 
you know, probably there's, um, it's not quite as simple maybe as, a, as it looks, but I would really recommend for people to look at the content that PubMed has put out. Their guides and tutorials are really excellent. And I would also recommend people to just explore and um, use PubMed and practice with it. And, um, you know, maybe there are some things that are more like specific shortcuts that I like to use, but I think that everyone can find beneficial content in PubMed and it's, um, it can be really helpful to empower citizens through public libraries and help students become more college ready and have a better understanding of how science research happens, um, what and how to find, you know, valid information online. So Margie, I think that at this point, I'm gonna open it up to questions. Um, okay. Great, great. I did put the PubMed link in the chat box if anybody wants to click on there and um, set up a, an account or, or do anything while we have Jacob's expertise here online because I learned a lot of things today, so I appreciate it. Well, I, I maybe have a question, um, and this might be for the librarians to answer. Oh, there's a question here in the chat box here. Um, have you run any tailored programs for or found any specific needs from demographic groups such as seniors or mobile device users? Um, well, you know, to, to clarify, I, I don't work for the National Library of Medicine, so I couldn't necessarily tell you that, but I do know that um, from looking at the way that new PubMed has been uh, organized, that they're seeing an increasing number of people using PubMed on mobile devices. And so a really nice new feature of PubMed is that um, it now has a screen that will, you know, reshape all of the, win the window. When you change the size of the window, it's a lot more responsive to the size of your screen. And, you know, another really beneficial thing about uh, the fact that it's been really updated to benefit mobile user device mobile device users is that um, some of our lower resource populations not only in the United States but all around the world are more reliant on mobile devices and so this is going to help them better connect to um, really valuable life sciences information so yes I think you know when I think about it sometimes I think about um, you know under under uh you know hospitals around the globe in in more resource limited locations where the uh you know staff is now going to be able to have connection to PubMed better through their mobile devices because mobile devices are just way more um you know prolific but also yeah absolutely for um for public library users who may also be a lot more dependent on just having a mobile device and may not have a computer at home, the new PubMed is really beneficial for them. Um, for seniors, I'm not quite as sure about, but I, I actually would also recommend that people who have not heard about Medline Plus check out Medline Plus. That's more of um, patient health and consumer health oriented. PubMed at the end of the day is it's a primary research uh, primary research literature a repository. So um, researchers and scientists and public health uh, analysts all over the world, when they publish original research, they can uh, look there. And I think you know that's why it's beneficial for um, policymakers, for students who are writing papers, for um, engaged citizens, but um, if we're talking more about like um, demographics needing to be connected to like patient health information, I still think that Medline Plus is probably uh, the way to go there. And, you know, again, I'm, I don't work for NLM or for NNLM. I'm just sort of uh, talking about, I was brainstorming with Margie, how so many more people are, are looking up, you know, um, health information these days and how PubMed is just so much more accessible to uh, navigate. And so it just feels like a good opportunity to help connect public librarians and 
uh, their patrons to um, to access PubMed. And I see that um, Rebecca just shared uh, three PubMed classes available, and I would really recommend those for um, more in-depth, you know, learning how to navigate and um, you know, learning proper best uh, best practices. Those are really great classes. Uh, today's class, I was kind of hoping more to like talk about uh, how citizens and students can can uh, take advantage of new PubMed and and use its features to get connected to the information they need. And if you are interested in learning more about uh, helping your patrons do that and be really being a PubMed expert, I would really recommend taking the other NNLM classes. They're really great. Yeah, you know, one thing I've noticed. Um, Jacob, and you might talk about this. I've seen Medline on a lot of library, public library sites, but they don't have a way to search it. You know, so they, I think people get confused about what Medline is. And then, you know, it's like you and I talked that PubMed is the perfect, is the companion. And yet you, you can't, it's hard to have one without the other. And, um, it's, it's, I know we've talked to some Kansas libraries that are already, it was kind of an aha moment for them. So, um, um, yeah, I, I appreciate you kind of taking this on because it's, I think more people are going to be having questions about what's available in the medical field and the medical world and want to be doing a little bit of their own research and this is perfect, uh, to show them how to do that. Yeah, yeah. So, uh, what Margie is, is referring to is, um, Medline, which is the, you know, the index that's really the backbone of PubMed is also available on some other platforms. Um, and they're just really more, you really kind of have to know your way around the, not only the platform, which is, you know, it might be easy for librarians who are already used to, um, EBSCO platforms and things like that, but, it, it's also, you just really have to uh, have more specialty knowledge in the field also. So I really like what PubMed has done as far as trying to connect more, um, a broader population of users to this vital information. Um, you know, one thing that we haven't really mentioned, but I think everyone knows is that, you know, so much of the, um, uh, a lot of health funding gets especially at the basic sciences level, comes from taxpayer funding. And so you're paying for this research, uh, your patrons are paying for this research, and so uh, they're entitled to at least see the uh, title and abstract and, and see where their um, taxpayer money is going. And, um, you know, we may have a time soon in the future where um, people can get access to everything that uh, all taxpayer funded full text articles. But for now, at least, if you want to get a connection, you want to know, okay, well, like, what, what kind of research is going on? Where is my taxpayer money going? Yeah, but you can go to PubMed, and you're, you've paid for it already. It's a federally funded project, and it will connect you to all the latest uh, life sciences research and information that's available out there that is going to empower people and make our country a stronger democracy, and also is available to everyone in the world, which is really um, one of the best uh, – one of the best things, in my opinion, about PubMed is uh, how much of this, you know, if, if you were in Ghana, you could go to PubMed. If you were in Jordan, you could go to PubMed. So super beneficial, super useful, and um, I hope that more public libraries will start to include a link to PubMed on their website so that uh, their patrons know about it. And if they start getting more questions from their patrons about navigating the life sciences and biomedical literature, I hope that they'll think about taking some other NNLM classes, super useful classes, and, and just generally making PubMed a bigger part of the public library ecosystem. Yeah. Thanks. Do you have a favorite app for PubMed? Um, well, I don't, you know, it's just been a big game changer having it on the mobile device now. Mm -hmm. uh, the the new website on the mobile device is it's really it looks great on mobile, and um, it's um, I'm just so happy that that they've been able to do that. And yeah, you so know, if you go online or if you look at some of their uh, uh, you know stuff, there's definitely feedback. It's not uh, totally flawless, but it's just so much more accessible to people who don't own a computer at home. They can go on their mobile device and use PubMed. And it's, um, 
it's just nicer to look at and easier to navigate. So I um, don't yeah. really need an app then. <laughs> no, you just uh, cool. Maybe maybe one day there will be an app, but I think for now it's just a browser-based resource, and it's uh, it, it looks really nice on browsers these days. So that's great. Okay. Well, um, any last questions or any uh, thing that you'd like to ask Jacob about before we conclude? Well, it doesn't look like there's anything in the chat. So um, I thank you very much, Jacob. It was great. Uh, we're going to go ahead and um, there will be a survey or you know, a, a, an evaluation at the end of this, and you may get a pop-up that leads you out of uh, WebEx. So don't be afraid um, to go ahead into that. We always want your feedback. It helps us to improve our content and to improve our uh, webinars and the courses that we provide. And we will have slides and um, and links to the sources in the chat. Yeah, absolutely. We'll go ahead and compile that and uh, put those together for you. Um, so when you will get a, a notification when the uh, webinar is up on our YouTube channel. And uh, we'll also go ahead and put these links and, and uh, resources that we've shared with you um, on the course page. So um, at this time, um, I thank you very much, Jacob. I really appreciate you taking the time to uh, share this great information with everyone. And um, at this time, I guess we'll, yeah, we'll, we'll conclude. Thanks, Margie, and, and thanks everyone for attending. I I hope that um, you will spend some time looking at PubMed and encouraging your patrons also. Yeah. Thank you very much. Yeah, we're getting a lot of thanks in our chat box, so appreciate it.